that I don't have any feedback issues, <laughs> but I think we should be good to go. So it's good to see you again, Jacqueline. Yes, you thank doing? you. It made it another day, <laughs> well, a week. I don't know, however long it's been since we talked. Can't, can't <laughs> complain too much on that then, right? Yep. Okay, so let's get into our topic of discussion today, which is perinatal anxiety, because <laughs> that's been a thing for a while anyways, and now it feels yes. like it's just up the ante. <laughs> yep, definitely amplified a lot <laughs> with being in quarantine, for sure. So can you give us, oh, and let me mention again that you are Jacqueline Holden from Holden Counseling and Education, and I will add all of your information um, into the comments at the end of the Facebook Live. Um, Excellent. Thank so you. let's get started. Um, what are some of the common prenatal anxieties when there's not a global pandemic <laughs> going on? So typically, um, we, we think there's about 16% of um, women that are experiencing anxiety. And when we talk about perinatal anxiety, that's really from the time of from pregnancy all the way through the first year of parenthood. So, um, you know, you'll hear, hear people talk about postpartum or postpartum depression. And we're really trying to um, expand everyone's vocabulary here with it and let people know that you can experience depression and anxiety and other mental health issues during pregnancy. And it can also um, pop up later after pregnancy. So it's not just, you know, that two weeks right after you give birth and that's baby blues. And then after that, it's something else, you know, depression or anxiety. Um, and so a lot of people are kind of surprised by that. They kind of think, oh, I made it through, you know, the first couple of weeks or I made it through the first few months. And then, um, you know, later in the first year, when you think about going back to work, uh, weaning, or even just changes in baby sleep or schedule other things going on that can, um, you know, shift and you can see some of these things come up later on too. So with anxiety, like I was saying, about 16% um, of women experience perinatal anxiety. And once you get into postpartum anxiety, it's a much wider range between like eight and 20%. And a lot of it is just that it's, we also don't have great data, right? So there's, I think there's a lot of people that um, have symptoms with anxiety and don't really know that it's anxiety that they're experiencing. They just feel like, well, I'm not sad all the time, or I'm not, you know, really tired and not wanting to do things that I used to like to do. So I guess I'll just keep trudging along and don't have a name for it. And so with anxiety, uh, a lot of times what people will, will experience is not just um, typical anxiety symptoms, but sometimes it will come out more like anger or irritability. And so that's um, a really good thing to note. I, I didn't want to talk too much about specific anxieties only because I don't want that to be a trigger for someone else. Um, but I will say that um, given being in quarantine, for those that have health anxiety, that's definitely something that we um, are seeing a lot more of. And as would be expected for those folks um, that were kind of prone to anxiety anyway, that that could be something that's coming up more now that we're all in quarantine <laughs> and that health issues are uh, top of mind for a lot of people. Sure. So if we're just talking baseline perinatal anxiety, um, what are some of the coping mechanisms that people tend to use that are effective? Yeah. So with anxiety, um, a lot of people um, will describe it as they kind of get stuck in a loop where they, um, it might be something that seems kind of small that will trigger their anxiety, like um, if you're out for a walk and you're, you're with your child and they pick something up or um, things like that, and that might kind of spark, some, spark your anxiety a little bit, and then it just kind of snowballs from there. Um, and so sometimes when that will happen, we'll recommend stop stopping techniques. 
So that can be things like even picturing an actual stop sign, but something that's going to um, kind of press pause or throw off that train of thought. And so um, this is where grounding techniques can come in really handy. And so what, cause what you're trying to do, like I said, is to throw off that train of thought. So if you are um, helping your brain to concentrate somewhere else, like um, putting your hands in the sink and running really cold water on them, or, um, or sometimes even putting a cold washcloth on the back of your neck, um, that that will disrupt those signals. And so that gives you enough time to slow things down so that as your mind might be racing a little bit, you can start to rein it in and implement some other techniques. Um, like um, in a, we talked about grounding, but also things that you want to do where you're putting that anxiety energy somewhere else. So um, instead of allowing your mind to just go on that spiral, um, connect with your child and read a book to them or um, listen to music. That can be really helpful. Some people will find that um, doing like a guided meditation can be really helpful. And so there's a ton of them on YouTube. There's um, a woman called Bella Ruth Napperstack. She has, it. it's a hard, I always have to write it out when I'm trying to spell it for people. Um, but she has wonderful programs for all types of anxiety um, and other um, conditions in pregnancy as well. And so um, I know a lot of people have found uh, listening to some of her work really helpful um, just because it allows for that time, that time for your mind to take a break. Gotcha. That's, that's super helpful. So let's move a little more specific to right now, um, yeah. the current pandemic. Um, and I am not currently pregnant, but I did try and crowdsource from some friends that are some of the questions that we have around anxiety and, and being mainly on the prenatal side right now, Yeah, uh, as far as what to expect. So the first thing would be, how do I deal with having less control? <laughs> yeah, and that's a really tough one even being outside of a pandemic, right? Because in pregnancy, there, there are a lot of things that we do know and that we can prepare for. And so we start kind of setting ourselves up. We're going to give birth in this way, in this place. We're going to you know, have a baby shower. We're gonna do all these things. We're gonna have maternity pictures. And this is changing a lot of that. And so a part of letting go of some of that control is acknowledging the grief that you're experiencing of the things you can't control. And so um, I know for a lot of people, that's really hard to do because you feel like, well, in the grand scheme of things, I didn't get to have a baby shower or do those maternity pictures. But, um, you know, if that was going to be a splurge this pregnancy and you didn't do that in a previous one, or this was going to be your last pregnancy, there is a kind of grieving that's happening. And so it's really important to acknowledge that you can be upset about that and be disappointed. And it doesn't make you less grateful for where you might be in all of this. It's something real that's happening in your life. And so allowing yourself to feel those feelings will make it easier to give up some of that control and easier to kind of move through that um, process. Understandable, understandable. So some of these follow-up questions kind of play off of that, um, but they're yeah. more specific scenarios, I guess. So um, what about if you're feeling really anxious about only being able to have one support person? So let's say you were expecting to have a doula mm -hmm. and, and your, your partner, and yeah. now that's not the case. Like, how do you decide? And like, how do you get to a point where you feel okay with that? Um, not having other people that were going to be there, maybe a, a, your mom or your sister or something, because you have to choose somebody else yeah. to be that one person. How do we work yeah. through that? And that's tough too, because it's different depending on where you're at. So different hospitals have different policies. 
Um, and then if you're at a birth center uh, or at home, obviously that's, you're going to have a different experience. So um, it's definitely good, especially with things changing so frequently to be in close contact with your provider and find out, you know, what is your policy? Be really clear. Don't just rely on someone who gave birth there a month ago or someone who's planning to give birth, you know, after you make sure that you really check in with your specific provider to get that information so that you can come up with a plan. But if you're only allowed one person, then um, it's important for you to check in with yourself and see who is the person that's best going to support me during this labor and birth. And again, depending on the hospital policy, is there any kind of tag teaming or is there any kind of, you know, when maybe there's a certain point, maybe you want the doula there for um, a certain amount of time and then your partner to come in at the end or vice versa. And so if, if you only get one, then that's kind of the combined process of grieving the experience you thought you were going to have and allowing yourself to be upset that all of the planning you put into choosing the right doula and talking to the friend or your mom or your sister, you know, coordinating with your partner, taking the, the classes, if you took a birth class before, um, you know, allowing yourself to grieve through that and then really look at your situation. What do I need during this time and who's gonna be able to support me through that? And who can I use on the other side? So maybe um, instead of getting wrapped up in this, you know, let's say most people are giving birth in the hospital and they only get one person and it's for this three days tops. For, for most people, that's typically how long you're in the hospital, right? So um, putting it a little bit into perspective, like you can have, you know, maybe it is just your partner during the actual birth, but maybe your partner is also um, recording part of it, if that's what you want, or taking pictures. Um, and then making those plans for afterwards to see, is there anyone that can support me and how will they be able to support me afterwards? And again, it, it may not be able to be in the same way, um, but they can still, they were willing to support you before and they're gonna be willing to support you in this new plan and it's just gonna take some creativity, creative problem solving to figure out how do we wanna do this now? Um, Cause there's still, you know, people can still drop off meals. People can still, um, you know, they may not be able to take your children and play with them, but maybe they could bring a new toy um, or something to help with entertaining if you have another child at home. That's a good idea. <clears throat> so. Speaking of other children, if this is a second, third, or more birth, uh, and you have kids at home, um, how do we get to a place where we're not worrying about them while we are trying to give birth and recover immediately after? Immediately after, because it sounds like regardless yeah. of the situation, they aren't going to be able to be there right now. Um, so, how do how do we get comfortable with the idea that they'll be with somebody else? It, especially if they've been just with us during quarantine, you know, um, right. and like feeling okay that they will be okay. Yeah. And, and part of that will come with whatever, um, whatever due diligence you're doing for that person who's going to be caring for them. Is it um, a family member that you are comfortable with whatever quarantining they've been doing on their own? Um, and then, or is it a, provider that's coming in that you feel comfortable that they, you know, again, that they've been doing what they need to do on their end. And then that amount of, like we've been talking about with everything else, that's another piece of control that you have to give up a little bit, right? That this, you thought things were going to go this certain way and maybe it was going to be your child was going to go stay at a friend's house or you were going to have someone come in that, that can't come in or that you're not comfortable with coming in anymore. And that's important to recognize too, that your plan may need to change based on your comfort level in this moment and not where things were a few weeks ago. And so um, that it takes a certain amount of flexibility on everybody's part 
um, going through this time. That's a good point. Um, so I actually have a whole bunch of questions, but for time's sake, I'm going to like try and consolidate some of them. Okay. <laughs> um, so what about anyone who's feeling really anxious about being at the hospital specifically because mm -hmm. they feel there is a higher chance that they could contract the virus in that setting? Sure. So, um, again, I think this is another instance where being really, um, communicative with your provider can be really helpful to, um, to ask these questions of them because I'm sure it won't have been the first time that they've um, been asked and um, not just ask, how is it that I'm going to be safe giving birth in the hospital um, or wherever it is that you are giving birth, but also what can I do to stay healthy while I'm there? Um, especially if it's a subsequent pregnancy where you've had a hospital stay before and maybe you were used to being able to walk around the halls and maybe that's something that they're not doing anymore. Um, so there, there could be policy changes. And again, it, it's probably different based on um, the hospital system, but, but good to check in and see what can I, what can I do? Um, what can I be in control of when I'm there? That's a good idea. Um, and that kind of feeds into like, uh, necessary appointments that you have to go to in person. Um, and, yeah. um, just in general, like being afraid to catch it and, and then having to deal with the aftermath post birth, that kind of thing. So that all kind of plays in together of like knowing your provider and what's going on. That makes sense. Um, yeah. what about anyone that's really, uh, worried about, the idea of like preterm labor and how that would look in this circumstance or even like going over your 40 weeks and having to do an elective induction or something. I mean, that's like a yeah. worry a lot of us have generally anyway. expecting, but I, yeah. I, know I would feel a little more elevated on that anxiety um, if, if I were in that position. Definitely. And I think, um, you know, in addition to the talking to your provider piece, talk to your support people. So um, you know, I know that a lot of doulas are doing virtual visits. So even if they aren't going to be able to meet with you um, in person, or they're not going to be able to be with you during your hospital stay, that you can still meet with them virtually. You can still meet with them um, virtually after um, you give birth. And so, uh, and with your, you know, check in with your partner and let them know that you're having these concerns so that they know it's on your mind. And so that if it's something that does come up, that they can be that additional support to you, that you don't have to hold that um, all on your own. That's a good point. <clears throat> um, that's probably a good idea to check in with our partners because they might be feeling something like that too, especially if this is the first time around. Yeah, well, and that we're all gonna be experiencing this different, differently anyway. And sure. certainly in this circumstance of being in quarantine, that can change things in different ways for, you know, you as a person giving birth and for the partner who's there to support you. And so I also like to remind people that um, from the perspective of, perspective of the person going through it, if, if you can be more communicative with your partner and with those support people around you, whether it's family you know, doula, lactation consultant, um, to get through that level of anxiety, because it can even produce some anxiety just thinking about talking to someone else about it. But when you let them in and let them know, like, here's where I'm at, here's what's going on for me, then they can understand a little bit more, because they're probably noticing things that are changing and parts of your behavior that look different, but maybe they can't quite place it. But then when you give them this context, it can start to make more sense. So instead of them saying, gosh, why are you so worried about this? Why can't you just, you know, we're, deal with it? They, ha they have a little bit more context to see where it's coming from. And then for the, for the partner or the support person or the family member, it's your job to be a support to the person giving birth. And so most of the time, unless they specifically ask you, they probably just want you to listen. And so they, they may not want to hear, lots of people are going through this, you're, you're just gonna be fine. 
you know, they, they want to be able to have a safe place to express, I'm anxious about this, I'm worried, or I'm fearful, or overwhelmed. And so it's good to, to have that in, your, in the back of your mind as the partner or support person, like, how can I help you in this moment? Or what would be helpful for me to say to you right now? Because sometimes you don't know what to say, except for it's, it's going to be okay. I have a feeling just relax is not the thing, <laughs> just based on my own experience. Yeah. Yep. If it were only yeah. that easy, right? <laughs> if it were only that easy, but, but not quite. Yeah. Okay. So to wrap up that end of the conversation, what if it's just that I'm just scared feeling? Yeah. Um, again, I think acknowledging I'm scared. This is a scary time. That's a, that's a legitimate fear. That's a legitimate feeling that, that things feel scary. And that combination, like we were talking about, um, that feeling of being out of control for a lot of people, if that's, you know, if that's your jam, being like, I'm the one in control, I've got the plans for everything, I know what to do if, you know, I have my contingency plans. Who had a contingency plan for this? Right. And so, um, you know, I, I don't want to underestimate giving that some space and just saying, acknowledging that that feeling is there. Gotcha. So moving on from scared to, and I think you touched on this previously, like feeling guilty about some things. I'm just mm -hmm. sad about things. Yeah. So for instance, let's say, uh, particularly if this is a first uh, pregnancy or first baby, um, if you don't get that shower, like that's a part of the process that a lot of people look forward to. Yeah. Um, because it is a celebration of something new and exciting. And if you don't get that, that I could see how that would, that would make me sad, you know? Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, that's another case where spending some time acknowledging that it, that really sucks. And it, you know, if you, especially if you had already planned it, you know, invitations gone out, people were excited and then to have it be canceled, it, it does, it just, it, it feels crappy. <laughs> and um, and moving past that then after, you know, acknowledging that that's what's going on and seeing, can I still have something like that? Can I do something online and still get to see people and connect with the friends or the family that we're going to be hosting and have some kind of experience? Can I put it on the back burner for now and say, I'm going to have a party, um, you know, after the baby is born and after at whatever time it is that we can gather um, and get together and celebrate that there will, there will be other times to celebrate and, and what might that look like so that you get to do a little bit of daydreaming. Like this could still be fun. It just looks different. For sure. That makes sense for the shower. What if, what if somebody's really upset? And again, this is understandable because it's not like you can do it later. Um, if they can't get the maternity photos or the newborn photos um, from yeah. the photographer. Yeah. And that's really hard because like you said, and, and like I was talking about earlier, there isn't a do-over. And so it is really sad. And, and for any number of reasons that you might have had your heart set on having those maternity or newborn photos, and that under the circumstances, that's not going to be possible. But maybe there, you know, again, maybe there are still ways of someone, you know, can your partner take an okay picture so that you still have something? It's, it's not going to be as, you know, produced and beautiful in the same way, but you can still have those memories. You can still make those memories and still um, get that experience so that you still have something to look back on. Here's my, you know, one week, or here's my fresh new 24 hour old baby. Um, so there, again, it's, there's still that grieving that's happening because it's, it's upsetting. It was something you were planning on that's not happening anymore. I have a feeling there's a number of photographers around that would probably try and help people get the most out of their own photos uh, and maybe even do some editing after the fact. Again, like you said, it won't be the same, like standing in a field, holding your belly, like it won't be the same, but it'll be something. And I know there's some people out there that really do want to help 
feel that need. Um, so that's yeah. good. What well, and maybe you do, maybe you have a nice backyard or maybe you <laughs> have like, you know, something down the corner that you can sure. walk to. So it's, you know, again, it's, it's not the same as a professional, but this is what, this is the best that we have to do to, to use right now. Of course, of course. Got to get creative. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be some interesting creative projects that come out of it. It is just so yeah. sad. Um, yeah. So the last point on that that I'd like to make is something that I am familiar with, with some of my friends is that if, if you know, this is your last pregnancy and it's really not turning out how you had hoped, like, how do you deal with that knowing that you're not going to get this is, this is not going to happen again. Yeah. And that's, that is a heavy type of grief and that, um, it's really tough when you, when you feel like, okay, this is my last pregnancy and it's going to go a certain way. And here are the things that I wanted to do previously that I didn't. And so I'm going to do that this time. Or, um, or if it's your first and only pregnancy, um, that there, there is just a lot of grieving that's going to happen and it's not going to be a one-time thing. It will probably crop up throughout your pregnancy and even your postpartum time, because there will be that sense that I didn't get this experience that I thought I was going to have, but there are still, you know, like with everything else we've been talking about through that grief you can get creative and see what are the things that I can still do maybe just in a different way. Sure. Well, I think that wraps up all the questions that I had for now. Um, I know we focused mainly on the prenatal side of things at this talk. We'll probably have yeah. a post or postpartum uh, later on. Is there anything else that you think we should add to this conversation right now? Yeah, I, I want to add just a couple things and let people know that when you're talking to your providers, whether it's, um, you know, perinatal anxiety or, or postpartum anxiety, that um, if you're, if you are wanting to take any supplements or medication to make sure that you're in communication with your provider about that, because there are definitely lots of, of medications that are safe to take while pregnant or breastfeeding. Um, it's just really good to be in touch with them as far as um, how things are going, if you're having any side effects, you know, changes in dosing may need to happen. And that can all be a little, made a little more complicated by um, maybe not having office visits and maybe having more telehealth visits, but um, to not let that keep you from letting them know how you're doing if you, if you are taking a medication um, or a supplement to help with that. And then I want to let people know that um, one of the good things that's, that's coming out of this is that there are so many online resources and support groups. So I'm also a volunteer with Baby Blues Connection, and all of the Baby Blues Connection groups um, are online right now. So you can go to babybluesconnection.org and find all their lists of um, available groups. They, they have a lot of different, what, different times and days that are meeting. Um, and it can be really helpful to get some peer support and just be talking to other people who are really in it where you are right now so that um, you have that sense of community and here are these people that are um, going through something similar and can really understand where I'm at, uh, maybe a little bit more than your partner or family um, might be able to. For sure, Baby Blues Connection is a wonderful resource. We may even talk to them ourselves at some point, you never know. Um, uh, so thank you so much for, for joining us today, Jacqueline. How can people get in touch with you for more info if they need to? Yeah, so they can um, send me an email, uh, hello at holdencounseling.com, or they can check out my website, holdencounseling.com. Um, I'm not taking new clients right now, but I am teaching some online classes um, by request. And so I, I do teach a class on um, perinatal mood disorders for people who are going through it and for their partners or family to help understand what's going on. Um, and then I do some relationship classes as well for parents. So those are, those are available by request. Okay, great. I will make sure to add that into the comments just so that people have it. 
Um, we're also probably going to take the audio from this and putting it on the Raising Cascadia podcast as a bonus episode. We've got the first one from two weeks ago. Time is nothing to me anymore. No, Whenever it's nothing. Could have been yesterday. <laughs> Whenever <laughs> we talked last, that one regarding um, parenting relationships between partners yes. during quarantine is up over at Raising Cascadia now. So I'll get that one up there too. We're going to post it over um, on the actual website for Portland Mom Collective, you know, get all the things. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we'll probably have you back on at some point since we don't really know when this is going to end just yet. <laughs> I'm sure we'll find something else to talk about. Oh, for sure. For sure. Thank you all so right. much for, for joining thank me again. You. Yeah, right, thank bye. you. Bye.